Over the last few years, a great evil has been descending upon our world. An evil which has been growing more and more powerful. Its members use calculated, far-reaching violence and the threat of it to achieve their ends. Their ends, that is, the annihilation of anyone who dares to be different from them, of everyone who does not share their narrow and oppressive worldview. And so I'm pleased to announce that just a few moments ago, to strengthen our security agencies and to help make Canadians safer, our government introduced a strong new bill, the Anti-Terrorism Act 2015. The millennial generation and the generations before us have grown up watching Hollywood movies that seem to be a distant future and impossible reality. We've been told not to believe everything we see. While the sci-fi dystopian worlds may vary in these films, depictions of surveillance have always seemed to be a popular fear for movie makers. The difference between our generation and the ones before is that we have grown into a world where sharing our personal information online is a social norm. Um, privacy to me would be I'd say more like the things I keep from people. Yeah, just in broad terms. In the digital uh, context, uh, because we all live on in the internet, uh, privacy condensed to the way uh, our set. Oh, sorry, our information is taken by uh, companies. Our information is uh, perused through by governments. Uh, there's there's all hacking problems. There's like different kinds of issues. Yeah, I guess it it's uh, feeling comfortable in your own surroundings and knowing that others aren't intruding on your personal life. You should be able to live in this world without having somebody out there who knows absolutely everything about you because that's like a personal safety issue. You should be able to exist without somebody knowing your every move. We know that privacy is something that we should consider important, yet we are all guilty of sharing too much information online. With the new Canadian laws, our privacy concerns are no longer located just on social media, but have extended towards legal surveillance of our phone calls, text messages, and personal emails. People think that like there's like a one in a million chance that their lines are going to be monitored. And so they just, they, they think it's like not paying for the bus. They just think they can get away with it. Like they associate like the NSA or wh whoever is surveilling everything. Uh, they just don't associate it with what they're doing. They think their fucking cellular waves are different. Uh, I, it's, I don't know. I feel like it's a lot of young people. And a lot of young people still think they're invincible. We all have a right to privacy. We all have a sense of what that means as well. And we know when it's being invaded. We know when companies are taking our information against our wills. We unwillingly but knowingly give it away. We know all those I accept agreements, right? Like, when have you ever read through them? And like, have you ever said no? Because we want those services and we always say yes. Because that's the only option that we're left with. It's always a very... Uh, uh, it's, it's a dichotomy and it's a false dichotomy. It's either you accept or you don't. There is no option whether, oh, I protest. Is there an option of that? But no, we don't have that button. So it's it's a very interesting concept in the if you think about what your privacy actually is because you don't really, it doesn't really mean anything because companies already take that away from you the second you like, sign up for all their services. I understand that my data is everywhere at this point, but there's nothing that I can possibly do to stop it, so I might as well embrace it. I like my phone. <laughs> <laughs>
We accept the trade-off and understand that living a life through media comes with the price of privacy. This invasion of privacy is, of course, to make us safer. That is unless we are the ones deemed to be a threat. My concerns have to do with uh, the standards that are used to permit this information sharing, which I think are way too permissive. And it is these standards which would allow uh, a lot of information about ordinary law-abiding Canadians being sent to national security agencies, not because uh, these Canadians uh, are committing any mm -hmm. wrongful act, but in order to find among that information uh, what will identify security threats. Now, Conservatives were so concerned about privacy and, and freedoms that they cancelled the long-form census because it was such an intrusion on the privacy and rights of Canadians, yet are now embedding in this bill, C-51, the right of the state to have warrantless seizure and search powers without any oversight from a judge. Bill C-51 goes too far. The definitions are too vast. The scope goes way beyond anything that's required or at least for which any evidence has been brought forward by the government. But the thing that's the most controversial for me uh, and I find it really repugnant, is the fact that there is a breach of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This bill makes it law that the judges can breach it. Even if you're not doing anything wrong, you're being watched and recorded, and the, the storage capability of these systems increases every year consistently by orders of magnitude, uh, to where it's getting to the point you don't have to have done anything wrong. You simply have to eventually fall under suspicion from somebody, even by a wrong call. And then they can use the system to go back in time and scrutinize every decision you've ever made, every friend you've ever discussed something with, and attack you on that basis to sort of derive suspicion from an innocent life and paint anyone in the context of a wrongdoer. I'm a permanent resident in Canada. I was born in Northern Ireland. I was born in Belfast, which is not the nicest place so there's been red flags have gone up for me at like airports and stuff before and at the border. Um, what do I know about the IRA? They're, they get you like a gang. They're a real, they're a real, like they're still a viable threat. They're not nearly as bad as they were in the 70s, but like they get you uh, through like my uncles when like the equivalent of the, of the Nazi youth. But yeah, my mom said when I was 16 that if we hadn't left, I'd be dead or in a gang. I don't live a very above the belt lifestyle. I could easily get taken down for that if I wanted to. Because there's stuff out there. Like I don't talk, I don't ever talk about, like I talk about the IRA, but I don't ever talk, like jo even joke about being in it. But if they, because I, I'm, they're involved in drugs now after the 80s. So I'm sure, like, even if I was talking about, like, any party and I did, they could try and... I could, I could, I would totally lose that case. I'd get kicked out. So how do you feel about privacy? <laughs> A lot stronger than I used to. <laughs> it's not really something that we're gonna, we're gonna always feel, but, like, at any moment they could breach into your life. So that's, I guess, the concern. So it, it could never affect you, but it could also at any moment affect you very largely. There are benefits to it, but it's like not always, not everyone's benefiting. <laughs> the privacy should not be dissolved, like the meaning of privacy should not be dissolved for the masses on an entirety just because of suspicion. It, there should be proof in terms of at least mild amounts of proof which is prosecutable in, uh, in the court of law. Otherwise, there's no point in having those having that surveillance and you know just prosecuting people, persecuting people on the basis of uh, suspicion. That's just unfair. I think again, uh, some level of increased information sharing uh, is appropriate. Here we have all potentially all information about all Canadians being shared. I think that's excessive. I think there could be uh, mistakes made in the analysis of this information by security agencies uh, in good faith or as some people have said through uh, excessive enthusiasm in trying mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. uh, find security threats. So errors are possible uh, and uh, more review, uh, higher standards uh, would uh, I think make sure that information sharing could occur but uh, human rights, privacy rights would be respected.
Millennials have more of an advantage than any other generation in all of humanity to stand up against the powers that loom over us. Yet with things like Bill C-51, we have to ask how free we really are. There are dozens of psychological studies that prove that when somebody knows that they might be watched, the behavior they engage in is vastly more conformist and compliant. Human shame is a very powerful motivator, as is the desire to avoid it. And that's the reason why people, when they're in a state of being watched, make decisions not that are the byproduct of their own agency, but that are about the expectations that others have of them or the mandates of societal orthodoxy. This realization was exploited most powerfully for pragmatic ends by the 18th century philosopher Jeremy Bentham, who set out to resolve an important problem ushered in by the industrial age, where for the first time institutions had become so large and centralized that they were no longer able to monitor and therefore control each one of their individual members. And the solution that he devised was an architectural design originally intended to be implemented in prisons that he called the panopticon the primary attribute of which was the construction of an enormous tower in the center of the institution, where whoever controlled the institution could at any moment watch any of the inmates, although they couldn't watch all of them at all times. And crucial to this design was that the inmates could not actually see into the panopticon, into the tower, and so they never knew if they were being watched or even when. And what made him so excited about this discovery was that that would mean that the prisoners would have to assume that they were being watched at any given moment, which would be the ultimate enforcer for obedience and compliance. The 20th century French philosopher Michel Foucault realized that that model could be used not just for prisons, but for every institution that seeks to control human behavior, schools, hospitals, factories, workplaces. And what he said was that this mindset, this framework discovered by Bentham was the key means of societal control for modern Western societies, which no longer need the overt weapons of tyranny, punishing or imprisoning or killing dissidents, or legally compelling loyalty to a particular party, because mass surveillance creates a prison in the mind that is a much more subtle, though much more effective means of fostering compliance with social norms or with social orthodoxy, much more effective than brute force could ever be.